Good morning, class. Now, let's not waste any time. Let's go ahead and get right started. We have a lot of material to get through today. So go ahead and open up your textbooks to page 197, and we'll be getting started. But first, let's go over a couple things that we learned last week from the French and Indian War. Just with a couple questions, and then we'll move on into our topic for today. So first off, what was the most decisive battle of the French and Indian War? Holly? Yes, that is correct. The Battle of Quebec in 1759 was deemed by many the most important battle of the French and Indian War because for a lot of reasons, including what your class textbook says, it is one of the battles that broke the French's back. More can be said for some other battles were fought in the war being just as decisive or even more decisive, but according to your class text, they specifically mentioned that the Battle of Quebec was the most key battle in the French and Indian War. What treaty ended the French and Indian War? Jason? Yes, the Treaty of Paris is correct. That treaty ended the war and ceased hostilities between the French and the English. Now, what did that treaty force the French to give up? Kaya? Say so, yes, you are correct. Very, very good. The treaty forced the French to give up their lands in North America and give them to the British. Now, last question for right now is, what was the name of the important fort that George Washington tried to capture at the very beginning of the French and Indian War, failed, and then the, the fort had to be retaken later on in the war? Landon. Yes, that is correct. Fort Duquesne. Good job on pronouncing it correctly as well. All right, let's go ahead and move to our topic for today, which is introducing the Revolutionary War. Now, before we get started, I want you guys to go ahead and split into your groups of three, just like we, we've been doing. And I want you to answer this question. Is war ever necessary? Keep in mind what we've been going over with our scripture references as well regarding what the Bible teaches us in Romans about how we as Christians are to follow the electors or the governments that God has placed above us, unless, of course, they go contrary to God's word. You have about two and a half to three minutes to answer that question. Go ahead and go. Yes, Susanna, what is it? Say that this is not just according to what the class text says about war. This is based off your own opinions, based off the knowledge that you know is or should war be necessary. Miles, let's be working on that now, not talking about what we're going to be doing after class. That's looking very good, Landon. Keep it up. Keep it up. Good job. All right. Let's go ahead and let's see what we've got. Kaya, would you like to present your answer to the question? Is war necessary? You believe it. It shouldn't be necessary, but unfortunately, it is. Okay, could you can you build on that a little bit? Why shouldn't war be necessary? Yes, I agree. God's word specifically mentions that we should abstain from violence. We're not to kill another human being. Yes, that's where you are correct. Accord by man's sin after the fall in the garden. Often, mankind cannot handle difficult situations without resorting to some form of exerting control or force over someone else, whether it be another man or another nation. And that 
builds a lot of the confidence that we see today. That's very, very good. And I look forward to seeing more of your answers. Go ahead and pass those uh, three by five cards up to the front. And let's go ahead and move on into the lesson. And as we look at this, the French Indian War has just ended. Okay, so we're looking at the economic situation in both the colonies and the crown. Now, in England, they have just finished fighting a very, very expensive war. Okay, and not only that, but they have been fighting an expensive war on another continent. So what do you think was the overall feelings that were going on in England, both in the government and the population at this time, regarding the expense that was being made? Kaya? Yes, that is, that is mostly correct. The, many of the citizens, especially in the government, felt that because they had expended so much resources in helping the colonists, that they felt that the colonists needed to pay um, and bring funds necessary in order to keep up, you know, maintain the English army that had been so formidable. But now the colonists, they didn't view this quite the same way. The colonists, in their mind, they had just helped their nation as they viewed themselves as English citizens. They felt that they had just helped majorly and drive the French out of their land. And so what they thought they had done was for the king and England. And so they felt that they were just done their rights as English citizens. And thus, as these words of taxation and um, payment and reparation came to the forefront of many conversations, they are going to be quite angry and much less almost hurt by these accusations that they needed to pay. So what were the methods that transpired in order to uh, make these reparations, to maintain an army so far away from home. Well, the first thing that was done is the King of England and the English government did this through proclamations and different acts that were passed. Now the first one is very little is known about the expanse of America at this time, but settlers were starting to push to the west across the Appalachian Mountains. So in 1763, the King and English Parliament passed the, a law stating that settlers, that was a boundary line that the settler lines could not cross and use a lot of uh, methods such as, you know, we're leaving that land to the Indians, you know, as part of their reward for helping with the French and Indian War and a lot of more legal type jargon. But the colonists saw it from another perspective. They saw it as the crown exerting control Miles, let's keep eyes forward, please, and paying attention. They saw it as a crown trying to exert control over what should be basic rights of them being able to move and settle wherever they were at. And they were much, much more frustrated because they didn't have a say in the process. This did not come from their local governments. This came strictly from the crown. Now, the next part that comes up was even more aggravating and frustrating than colonists. And that is the result of acts and taxes. These acts that were passed by the English Parliament would help pay for these reparations and these costs of such an expensive war. And they were passing on the colonists to help pay for them. Now, the colonists, very interesting to you know maintain, the colonists did not mind the fact that they maybe should pay some taxes to help with the upkeep and the overall you know, funding of such an event so far from home. But what they did not like is they did not like have not having a say in this process. According to them, that was tantamount to tyranny because they were just getting told what to do. So, and you have to remember as well, what do you think or how long do you think it took back then to get a message from England to the colonies? 
So you look at it today, you guys have your cell phones and tablets, the communication like that, you can send a message to anywhere in the world within a matter of seconds. But how long do you think it took back then to get a message to England? What do you think, Jason? A month? But I say, you're not too far off. Does anybody else have a guess? Susanna? Two months. Well, we're actually a little bit in between. Uh, and with good weather, it typically took about six weeks to for a ship to sail across the Atlantic, back and forth from England to the colony. So imagine, a lot can happen in a matter of six weeks, both positively and negatively. So you have to really, when you're thinking about this, you have to think about the time that trans, the time that goes by between a letter being written and sent here and arriving at its destination. So during these period of these years following the French and Indian War, English Parliament passed quite a few laws. First one was the Quartering Act. Now, Quartering Act was a crown pass saying that the colonists had to lodge English soldiers in their homes. Now, you can imagine what this would have done is instead of allowing the colonists, you know, either just to build barracks or uh, enable the soldiers to stay all together, this is taking the soldiers into their home and then that you're giving them the best of your um, sleeping arrangements and quarters as well as food and again this is forcing someone to go come into your home without your say so which I imagine you guys would not like and neither did the colonists back in this time. Other acts that were passed as well were the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act and the Townsend Act. Now all three of these resulted in taxes that the colonists had to pay a tax in order to use stamps in order to buy sugar in the case of the towns and acts such as tea so you think about it you are going to the market back in these days and you need to get some sugar you need to get some tea which is a very popular drink at this time period now instead of just so you set down your money because you know it's it's been the same for however long and then find out that without your approval, without even your input, that your government across the ocean has said that you need to pay X and X amount more for these necessities that you need in your household. This infuriated the colonists because they felt like they weren't even being listened to. Their grievances weren't even being considered by the English crown. Now again, remember the time travel difference. So what, if this was happening to you, what would be your response? If they were going to charge you this much more for sugar and tea, what would you do? What do you think, Holly? Not buy. Okay, that is actually a very good point. It's exactly what many of the colonists did early on during this time frame, the colonists refused to buy tea. They refused to buy sugar. They were boycotted so that way the English would get no money off that and hopefully that would get their message across. But unfortunately, it did not work. So, in, in regards to that, since they boycotted as a trite way to means to get their message across, what do you think would have been, could have been a better communication? What do you think, Jason? Not sure? Oh, I'll come back. Kaya, what do you think? Say, yes, a letter and methods like that could have possibly worked better than trying to book up. But remember, what's the time travel and how long does that take? They're hurting and upset about this now. Do they want to wait six weeks for their grievances to get to England and then another six weeks to hear back? Say, that is the most of the part of the problem regarding the Crown and the colonists trying to fix these problems. And so, and remember, the colonists did not completely oppose being taxed. They only thought that they needed to have a say that this should get talked about at the Crown, passed to the Parliament, 
passed to the local governments and then enacted with their say so. And then they would probably have enacted some small measures to help pay for these reparations and costs of maintaining an army so far away from home. Now, once the colonists realizes that both the crown and the colonists were getting more and more upset, more and more outbursts showing their anger in this, the matters kind of come to a head. What's commonly known as the Boston Tea Party, in which the colonists dressed as Indians poured tea out into Boston Harbor on a very, very cold December night. What do you think the crowd's response would be to such a drastic method? Holly? So yeah, they would be looking for revenge or to put down such an unruly rebellion usurping their authority. And thus when that news gets back to England, the king, King George III, and Parliament are going to be very upset and even more acts are going to get passed down on Americans, showing how each side, while trying to show their viewpoints, are instead caught feeding the fire. Okay. So now we're going to break off into this next point, as you're going to individually, you have a piece of paper in front of you, you're going to write your own letter to King George, based off what the textbook and what you've learned in class about the taxes and the needs of the English government versus the ideas of the colonists and their own ideas, and also based off of what the Bible says in Romans about being respectful to authority. I want you to start penning your own letter to King George III with either your support or rejection of these acts that have been passed, okay? Go ahead and begin. Jason, eyes on your paper, please. I know class is almost over, but stay focused. Yes, Holly. Yes, remember that you are talking and you're hoping this will be read by the king himself. So, you need to make sure you take that into account in your use of words and your language and your tone as you want him to be listening to you, not just read and be upset by the tone and method and then just write you off like he has already some of the comments. All right, go ahead and put your pencils down. We will continue that letter and finish it in tomorrow's class. For right now, we're going to close just with a couple of questions. Why were taxes important to the British? Jason. Yes, yes indeed. They needed taxes to pay for such an expensive cost of keeping an army so far away from home and keeping it outfitted, keeping it fed, and prepared to fight in case of trouble. What message did the Boston Tea Party convey to the English crown? Yes, Kyle. That'd be correct. It really showed the English crown that the colonists were not going to take this standing down. They wanted their voice to be heard no matter what. And since the initial methods were not working, they were going to start taking more drastic measures, even at the expense of rejecting their authority. All right, very, very good. Now, as we leave, the bell's about to ring, I'd like to just leave this question with you. If you were the king of England and all this was happening so far away from home, what would be your answer to the questions and the demands of the American colonists in this matter of taxes and representation?